Welcome to UX and Data. So tonight we have Sagar Mohite. Did I get that yes. right? <laughs> okay. Who is a programmer at Uplevel, which is the first intelligent cybersecurity system powered by graph-based machine learning. And they're right here in this space uh, in Workbench. Um, Sagar focuses on combining principles of design and computation to generate visualizations. He's previously built visualizations for Twitter and IBM Research. In his spare time, he likes to design experimental sci-fi games. And you'll hear more about all of this in his talk, so please welcome Sagar. Thank you, Kim. So my name is Sagar, and I want to start, about, start with, uh, my, with a small story about my visual journey. So I started writing code when I was about 13. And this right here is a recording of one of the earliest visualizations that I made uh, using a programming language called C++. Uh, so today I want to talk about how I got into the science and the art of data visualization and how visualization as a practice can help you uh, create better designs. So I was fascinated by the idea of writing code that produced a visual output. To see that a few lines of code could transform into something fun on my computer screen provided like instant gratification and kept me wanting to learn more. So this particular visualization was written about 13 years ago when I first learned about the concept of loops in programming, which is something you use to automate a task that has to be re repeated over and over again. Uh, and this interest in producing like interesting visuals uh, slowly transformed into an interest in the visuals themselves. Uh, these were uh, some of the posters that, that I designed uh, when I was formally learning concepts from visual uh, language theory, color theory, typography, and other classical design principles. I love the idea of expressing these design principles through code. And so generating visual design through code was something that absolutely fascinated me. And so then I went on to study computer science, and that's when I start, got into making generative visualizations that were driven by data. Uh, let me give you an example of like one of my earliest uh, forays into database. Uh, so I was working as an open source contributor on a project by Mozilla, uh, where I was required to frequently uh, check the memory consumption uh, that the Firefox browser uh, used. The memory usage investigation page looked kind of like this. It was called About Memory, and it was kind of clunky, difficult to use, because it was like super long, and it was really hard to find relevant information, uh, such as memory leaks, uh, in this giant data set. So I proposed to redesign this visualization as a part of, my, uh, as a part of Mozilla's uh, Google Summer of Code. And I created something that looked like this. It featured a dashboard that developers could customize uh, to see relevant metrics about memory utilization and identify memory leaks. The interesting thing that happened here was this project served as a proof of concept to me that visualization as a practice could not only be my hobby, but also a profession. Which brings me to today. So currently, I work at this company called Uplevel, which Kim, was, Kim, Kim gave a really nice introduction about us. Uh, I don't think I can match that. Uh, <laughs> and we use graph theory to help enterprise software, uh, enterprise cybersecurity teams identify patterns and expose relationships among the thousands of security alerts that, are, uh, that they process every week. And uh, these alerts are sort of coming in by the thousands. So most software systems today store data in a tabular format, and that's great. Uh, but it's a lot harder to express uh, like context and the historical significance and relationships behind these data through this format. And that's where Uplevel uses like graph-based data structures to store uh, such data. So a graph data structure is basically optimized to preserve relationships and express uh, context between various data points. It uses a set of nodes, each representing some information, and a set of links that connect these nodes to express the type of relationship between them. But storing data in a graph format is not enough. Like, w that's where we have to bring in visualization to sort of express that data and to the end user to make it easy to understand. 
And I'm often asked, like, what are the things people can do to uh, build better, actionable, easy to understand, and effective visualizations? Now, there is no single approach to build better visualizations, but there are definitely things that you can do, in my opinion, that can help you get started. And these are some of the things that I've listed uh, as good starting points. And the core principle behind each of these points is that you need to understand your data and understand your audience before you adopt a visualization technique. So let's walk through them. Uh, the first one is identifying uh, primary aspects of data. And because this is a talk about visualization, I've made a few visualizations to illustrate the point. Uh, let's see an example of how we can go around identifying primary aspects of data. So this is an example of uh, all the subway stations in New York City. Well, some of them, but like, there's, the list goes on. Uh, that I've obtained from NYC Open Data. Uh, they have a free and open API that anyone can use in, to download these uh, information points. Now, the primary aspect of data in this case uh, would be the subway stations and the different lines of trains that connect them, because you want to uh, express the MTA subway network itself. And we, so we can start by representing uh, the stations with circles and the train lines uh, with well lines that connect them. Uh, and let's label the stations and the trains. And that's great. Uh, we have a visualization. It's clear enough as to what lines run between these six stations. But the, is this visualiz visualization really scalable? Uh, probably not. For instance, like to distinguish between an express train versus a local train, we might need additional colors or shapes to represent them. And notably, as we add more stations to this network, our graph can become increasingly difficult to understand. Uh, and that's where uh, identifying secondary aspects of data and seeing how they relate to the primary ones comes into being. Uh, in our previous, but like identifying secondary uh, aspects totally defined, totally, is totally led by the way you define your requirements. In our previous examples, we assumed and we, start, we stated that our requirements were to visualize the MTA subway network. And for this, like the trains and the lines were our primary uh, data points. But our data, uh, from the open data uh, website also uh, contain the location of each station. So what happens if you uh, leverage that location information as a secondary aspect and involve it in the visualization? We end up with something that everyone is familiar with, the New York City subway map. But like th this is where I want to illustrate how having different uh, requirements can change what you consider to be a primary data attribute versus a secondary data attribute. So for let's say we had uh, our initial requirement was not to merely represent the subway network, but actually visualizing the subway map for, say, a mapping app. The location information then suddenly becomes your primary data aspect. And in such cases, you can use secondary aspects, such as metadata about where the viewer who's interacting with this is located. Uh, we can then use the user's location, for example, to zoom into a specific uh, point uh, in the network and show relevant data. Now, in real world, chances are that you're dealing, that the data you're dealing with is a lot denser and much more dynamic than a subway map. And this is where you use time to guide your narrative, which brings me to the third part. So I'm going to circle back to the up-level graph here, because I think it's a great example of a dynamic data set. The up-level graph constantly changes over time. As information about security alerts is received, and new nodes are connected, and uh, new relationships are established between new and existing nodes. This is a snapshot in time of a visualization that was created using up-level's graph. It has different types of nodes, each representing a specific data type. For example, the blue circles represent uh, people or machines that were targeted in an attack, and the green ones here represent different attributes of a suspicious-looking email that were sent to these people. So one of the best ways to sort of incorporate time into uh, visualization is through animation. 
like I love animation because it helps you express time uh, with the visuals. And instead of so showing a static visualization in the end, if we show a dynamic animation of how that re relationship was formed, it adds a lot more depth and lowers the cognitive overhead in terms of uh, interpreting that in information. For example, we can see that here the red uh, links is, uh, are formed uh, that are identifying these particular nodes as potentially important. Uh, but if we use like a time-based approach, we can actually see how these were formed uh, and when these were formed uh, and how the connection was established. Uh, oftentimes, it's also a great idea to supplement uh, an animated visualization with a storyboard, uh, which basically narrates what's happening on your screen uh, and offers more actionable insights to these animations. For example, like a suspicious email was received, and then we identified these two uh, targets and these two machines uh, that were that 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 received this email, um, and then eventually we did a comparison with uh, historical the historical significance of this email and identified that it, it was actually a malicious node and offered you some suggestions on the potential steps that you can take uh, to, to deal with this situation. Another, another approach to incorporating time uh, uh, as opposed to like storyboarding is using a time travel based approach. So it would be great to control these animations, now that we have these animations. So like this example shows you how you can travel back and forth in time to see how uh, this particular uh, set of subgraphs were connected with uh, like another uh, node in the database. So a time trial approach can not only be uh, relevant to gra graphs, but can be used in a lot of different applications. So before Uplevel, I was working at this startup called Argisat that launched nanosatellites into Earth's lower Earth orbit. The satellites could run student design experiments, and right now I believe they're running an experiment by the new school, which is right here. Uh, and over the last few years, the company launched several different satellites. This is a visualization that I made that shows the real-time position of each satellite on a globe. So the tiny red cubes here are the satellites, and the white cones that you're seeing are their fields of vision uh, from which they're collecting data. So the timeline at the bottom here uh, is something that you can use in a manner similar to the previous graph example that we saw to jump back and forth in time uh, and also to speed up the passage of time to see how these satellites can end up spanning the entire planet uh, and collecting data from uh, different parts of the world. You can also see the exact time at which a, a particular satellite will pass over your location. Uh, and so like, this is another example of a timeline-based approach. And the last example in this case is this particular visualization which I created when I was working at Twitter, uh, which is uh, basically showing the follower growth of World Cup, 2014 FIFA World Cup. Uh, for each uh, of the official team account. Uh, the timeline here shows the number of followers gained on each day and correlates them with like game days uh, and sees how, uh, if there are any patterns in like a game day versus follower growth. So enough talk about like getting, uh, the, getting to know the best ways to make visualization, but like, it, it's time we should probably just start getting our hands dirty. So there's this, uh, there's this really cool library called p5.js that is basically a drawing library, but it's optimized to be uh, used for like beginners. It's super beginner friendly, and uh, you can use it just like uh, another drawing tool called processing, if you're familiar with it, uh, to start drawing things with code. So I'm, I'm actually going to do a really quick demo here on reproducing this timeline from my Twitter visualization uh, with the help of the library.
So here I have some data that resemble, resembles the data that was uh, used to actually uh, create that timeline. It's basically a list of points uh, in time where each point shows the number of uh, average number of followers that, that the team gained uh, over a period of 24 hours. Yes. Right. So um, in P5.js, which, uh, which is a JavaScript-based library, uh, what we do is they, they have this set of, uh, function called setup, which runs at the beginning of your, uh, of your program. Uh, whatever you run will be, uh, whatever you write here will run exactly one time. So I'm going to go ahead and create canvas. Uh, I've, I've already pasted some code, uh, which I know is going to be useful. I'm going to paint the background with this gray color on the right. You're seeing the output. Uh, I'm going to set up some uh, parameters that control the text size, stroke, and uh, fill of shapes that I'm going to draw. So let's actually go uh, look at the data and go through one by one and draw the curve. So for that, I'm going to go back to the P5.js reference and see if there is a way I can draw curves. Oh, look, there is. <laughs> uh, so it basically says I can draw a curve through a given set of points, P1, P2, each with an x-coordinate x and a y-coordinate uh, in, in a way that uh, actually makes sense. So you actually uh, supply the points information to the curve, and the curve function will draw the curve for you. Uh, but this is going to get uh, really messy if I try to automate this through uh, whatever hundreds of points that I have in that fake data set. Uh, so I'm actually going to see if there's like another uh, method that I can use. And I believe it's called curve vertex. Here. So Curve Vertex basically allows me to uh, start a shape, add a point, add a point, add a point, add a point, and then end that shape. And then that completes the cycle. So I'm actually going to do that right here. So I'm going to start the shape first. And for each point in, uh, in my data, which is right here in a variable called data. I'm going to loop through that point. And draw the curve vertex by inserting that point. So I'm basically going to see each point in this and assign it to a variable called point. And then for each point, I'm going to I'm going to draw it using curve vertex. I'm going to I'm going to declare that it's a curve vertex. And in the end, I'm going to end the shape. Now if I run this, you'll see that there's a curve and this is all generated from the data that I have. So it was just a couple of lines. And I, I don't want to go into the technicalities of the programming language, because that's not the point here. But I wanted to make uh, give an example of how easy it can be to get started. Uh, uh, there are plenty of beginner level tutorials to get you started with this. Uh, I'm also going to go ahead and add the uh, little football icons that I had. Uh, I have copied an emoji here. Uh, and I'm going to use that to draw my football icon. But that's really that's really drawing a, a football for every single day, uh, even when the game was not played. We only want to draw the football icon when the team had a game day. So I'm going to say, uh, in the data, each point says whether the game was played or not. Uh, so I'm 
basically going to say if point, uh, what is it called? Game played. Only then draw the football. And this basically shows you what it might look like. I'm also going to translate it a little bit down so it's easy to, easy to read. Uh, so yeah, so you saw like how easy it was to get started with something uh, in like 10 minutes. Uh, well, I knew a lot of the functions here. Uh, I was just pretending I was searching, so you know uh, that searching helps. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so basically, it, the thing about getting started with programming is just about getting started. You have to just do it. Uh, search a lot uh, on Google, on internet, on, on, on their uh, documentation. Uh, YouTube has a lot of re references. Uh, there's this YouTube channel called The Coding Train, which has really good beginner-friendly uh, exercises uh, by this uh, professor at NYU called Dan Schiffman. Uh, I'm going to put up the links at the end of the uh, presentation so you guys have more context. So I'm going to go to the next part uh, of my presentation now. So all the points that I've made till now have been about like different things that help you get started with data visualization. but like. By no means was that supposed to be an exhaustive li list of things that you should do to make better visualization. In fact, they form like a tiny part of the different possibilities uh, of visualizing data. And this is where I really encourage everyone to break boundaries, not follow conventions, put aside everything you know about visualization, and just explore data without having a specific goal. It really helps you see things from new perspectives. Uh, and because this is a lawless section of my presentation, I'm going to, uh, and there are no rules here, I'm not going to prescribe any rules. I'm actually going to talk uh, about this only through examples of uh, certain projects that I worked on while I was uh, trying to explore visualization. So this is an example where I visualized, visualized all the contents of the first Harry Potter book. Uh, each word in the book was assigned a color Based on, what part of, uh, based, based on what part of speech it belonged to. And the results, while ab abstract, were still pretty unique. This is how the first chapter looked. There was nothing like this in the entire world that would match this exact arrangement of colors if you use the same uh, legend and the process to create it. It was kind of like a unique identifier or a data portrait for the, uh, for the book. Each word was now a pixel, which meant I could print the entire book as a book, which I did. Uh, and if I reduced the size of uh, each pixel, I could go ahead and print the entire book on a business card, which I also did. Uh, so this was super cool. And um, uh, this is another abstract visualization, which was basically like just a weekend project uh, uh, that I created. It, it, it is technically a traditional bar chart. Uh, the data is uh, something that I uh, obtained from New York Times, from the New York Times API. It, it basically shows the occurrence of the term space exploration in New York Times in the last 147 years in their articles, news, media, and outlets. Uh, but the aspect that I played upon here was one related to typography. I translated each bar in the bar chart uh, over the glyphs of the word space written in Helvetica. And so the end result used data from three sources, uh, the fonts, the letters, and New York Times uh, API to create an abstract graphic or a poster about space exploration in such a way that you know once you see the word space, you can't really unsee it. Uh, this is another example where, you know, th this is one of the more physical interpretations of data visualization that I was playing around with. It features a tiny 3D printed X-Wing from Star Wars that was retrofitted on top of a magnetic levitator below the table. So 
I was collecting all this track, skeletal tracking data from a Kinect sensor, and the magnetic levitator uh, below the table would move depending on how you move your hand. And this project was called The Force, for obvious reasons. Uh, the magnetic levitation made things look magical, but it was still all real. It was just physics. And uh, the one aspect that I really missed here was, you know, it, it was more of fantasy and not fiction. And I love fiction, especially science fiction. Uh, so I was always left with this uh, desire to build more science fiction oriented visualizations. Now we have science fiction stories, science fiction books, movies, podcasts, and I really wanted to work on something that would be considered a science fiction visualization. And that's how I came up with this 12-dimensional uh, game called Hyperspace. Uh, Hyperspace is an online game uh, set in a world where players uh, can join a really contorted, warped, bizarre world. Uh, so what is a 12-dimensional space? And how do I even start visualizing it? Uh, well, to un understand what is a higher dimensional space, we need to understand how space works. Uh, so imagine we have a 3D object in space, and there's a light source. Uh, so we are using perspective projection to show the shadow of that light source. Perspective projection is just a fancy technical term for shadows. Uh, now, if we rotate this cube uh, in three-dimensional space, the shadow starts expanding and collapsing. And this might seem to be something very natural to us because we see shadows every day. Uh, but consider uh, for one moment an, an imaginary being who is a two-dimensional being who has absolutely no idea of what three dimensions are, uh, or no idea of how a three-dimensional space looks like. For that creature, all, all it can see is basically, basically the warping shadow of, of the two-dimensional, uh, warping two-dimensional shadow of the 3D object. And it might just seem mysterious and magical to them because like, it's suddenly increasing volume and changing shape with, without any uh, specific reason. And I wanted to extrapolate that feeling to our world through the form of a game. Uh, this is what a three-dimensional shadow of a mathematically higher dimensional cube, in this case a four-dimensional cube, or a hypercube, or a tesseract, or you know, there are tons of terms for it. Uh, looks like. It's like the same contorting, warping thing, uh, but it's actually a three-dimensional shadow of a 4D object. Nothing is actually changing size or shape here except the shadow. And I found that this was an extremely fascinating uh, way to use, uh, ex extremely fascinating concept to actually build software around it and uh, convert it into a game. So in this game, you uh, fly around with a character called, uh, which is a robot, wh where you uh, collaborate with other players to sort of go through these giant, uh, bizarre, warped lands and solve puzzles. Uh, I'm going to play a video here. And uh, instead of talking uh, about the visuals, I, I wanted to actually just show them for a while. Uh, so y you walk around with this little robot called F Frost, and I in the same space, you know, you have like hundreds of other players joining, uh, joining the uh, uh, game. The idea is to sort of explore the landscape, create clues, and solve puzzles. Uh, but at the same time, you, because of the way the space is structured, it's still the same space, but everyone is seeing a different thing. Because two people can see this, a different shadow of the same object, depending on where that shadow is projected. Uh, so the idea in this game was to design a gameplay that would allow people to uh, actually see uh, actually find ways to align their shadows and their projections of the higher dimensional worlds uh, and use that to sort of make a gamified experience. 
It also has two-dimensional time, which I'm not sure what it is, but it's a narrative element. Um, and I think that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, you can definitely follow me later for, I forgot to put the links there, but uh, you can follow up with me later if you want links on some of uh, the resources that I talked about today. Cool. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to ask everybody to just limit themselves to one question, and I'll try to get around to everybody. Did I see a question right here? I thought I saw a hand right over here. Hi. Hey, this is just a short question, but did you say you built Hyperspace, the game? Yes. Oh, damn. I did. That was pretty cool. And um, that wasn't just a weekend project, was it? No, it was a six-month project, and it's still going on. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could maybe expand a bit on the stuff you're doing with uh, the the first part with the kind of conveying information and like sort of what uh, information you're trying to get across to people or what format it's in so is it sort of an interactive thing or are you you have the storyboard so there's some things you're explaining to as you go along and then yes. kinda how, how does that map back to the making it sort of uh, making a sort of almost emotional impression with the other stuff. Like, how do you weigh that in your in your daily work? Yeah. So um, I think this is a very good question. I think um, uh, the whole aim behind uh, having a storyboard as a redundant uh, way of displaying the same information in different form was to sort of form a cognitive link between, uh, in the minds of people to to show them that you know it's the same information. You're just seeing it in a different format. Uh, and that redundancy, I think, helps people associate data uh, and process uh, it in ways that you couldn't do through conventional user interfaces. So for example, like you're seeing this graph data structure, a data visualization, uh, which is really cool, but a lot of times it's hard to interpret. But like after associating it with like in a conventional format, you can actually learn uh, over time and uh, better be better equipped to interpret that complex visualization. Hi. Um, I was curious if you found yourself mapping other variables to animation other than time? And um, if so, like, how you decided to do that? So that is uh, super interesting. Like, uh, most of the times, like, Animation, by definition, is a time-based approach. But like, uh, it's it's also sort of if if something is not a temporal aspect, like animating that can be super tricky. Uh, I have actually tried uh, such things, especially in hyperspace, uh, where I was trying to map uh, space to uh, animation, and uh, it, it's not really changing over time. Nothing in that equation that was rendering that crazy looking visual was changing in time. It was all a static uh, thing. Like, no object in that game was moving, but like, except the camera maybe. Uh, but, the, but the space was, was still warping because of the way the camera was interpreting the shadow of a higher dimensional object. Uh, but that's a very interesting question. I, I, I wonder if there are like multiple ways to approach animation from, uh, from things that are not essentially time-based. It comes from a place of thinking about how the data set doesn't have a temporal element. Yeah. Whether you still think about using animation to iterate the different categories. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Like, it, it totally depends on the situation. For example, like you could still use animations to sort of zoom in on certain parts of, uh, uh, of the visualization that, are, that make more sense and help you filter down. For example, like the mapping app, like whenever you, whenever you open Google Maps, you, you're basically zoomed in on a default view. Uh, uh, or like Uber, for example, shows you uh, different cabs around you which are animating. There is a temporal aspect there, but like 
uh, depending on your uh, location, there are things that 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 Uber, Lyft, and all those other apps are animating that are not essentially time-based. So that is definitely an interesting proposition. Hey, really, ni really Hi. nice job. Uh, Thanks. Uh, my name's Kyle. I come from the VR world, and I'm wondering whether you've attempted to or have already brought some of your three-dimensional graphics into the virtual space. So the game was supposed to be, interestingly enough, uh, a VR game. But when I was actually making it uh, back in, like, I don't know, two years ago, it was making me sick. So I couldn't really design it. Because <laughs> uh, whenever I tried to make that, it was like, or debug it, it was extremely hard to sort of work with the physics and understand the space, because I have a really terrible case of simulator sickness. But probably in like uh, a few years, I'll be able to do that when, once like the VR. But, but, but uh, I, I'm actually currently working on a, uh, on a side project that, that is a fork of my uh, game, which actually displays those in an AR setting. Uh, so you can actually see those uh, higher dimensional objects on using augmented reality uh, in your real world. And like, as you move your camera, the object distorts. Uh, so that's something that I'm playing around with. Yeah, the first person perspective is really difficult. Yes. In terms of, uh, Absolutely. I can't do first person games either, so it was super hard to read. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Have you done any work in sort of training your users or the people who are um, experiencing the um, visuals that you're doing um, to um, try to help them experience sort of the 3D space as opposed to like a dashboard or a yeah. report? So um, uh, there was a lot of feedback collected uh, when I was actually uh, designing this about like and most of it was interacting with the game uh, when you were navigating through uh, that space. Because like, navigation was something that I personally found extremely difficult in, a first, in any first player game, for that matter. Uh, so I was talking with like, people who, are, who consider themselves as you know, daily gamers. And I was uh, collecting feedback. And I tried to incorporate that feedback into uh, into the game to sort of make it better, but like I don't think there was uh, there was an element where I, I was actually involved in training the users because uh, I personally don't like uh, when I get receive uh, tons of uh, instructions on how to use things, uh, but but it depends on uh, the situation again on what type of visualization. If it's like a, a very scientific visualization that requires you to delve more into data, then yes, definitely you can uh, design the interaction to help train your users. Yes, it's a question related to the previous one about the virtual reality. Uh, let's say that the data visualization helps us uh, visualizing uh, too complex data. Um, I was thinking, how do you see uh, immersive technology helping us visualize too complex visualizer? Yeah. So data, in my opinion, is always complex. Like uh, real world data has to be complex by virtue of being real world data. And so, but that doesn't mean your visualization has to be complex. Like because people can only process like so much at a given uh, uh, point in time. So that's where like finding context and exposing relationships and knowing the requirement comes in. Uh, and, then that, and these are all the parameters that you can actually use to filter down that complexity into something that is, uh, that is particularly a thing that people want to know about. Uh, so I personally don't like to see complex visualizations because uh, but but like there are definitely things that you can do to to reduce that complexity the Twitter example for ex uh, that I showed was visualizing the data that you were seeing was visualized from uh, 15 gigabytes of uh, data points that took like 
80, 18 or 24 hours to, to sort of pull from the databases. And uh, it was sort of organized in a way that, you know, you're only seeing certain things, things are aggregated, uh, the colors are representing a lot of information. And like that complexity was handled in code uh, so that the user doesn't actually experience the complexity. Uh, so yeah, D deciding on like filtering parameters to reduce complexity uh, is something that, regardless of whether it's immersive or uh, conventional interface, is something that would be interesting. As data visualization is getting more place in our lives, maybe uh, it's as well our responsibility to train and be able to be understand more complex uh, visualization. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Like, and that's where like training would play a role, like to teach ourselves to understand more complex things. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sire. Uh, so thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I wanted to let you know that it will be back here in just about two weeks on August 8th, which is a Wednesday night. And we'll have Latoy Adams doing a talk on UX research with kids. She'll be sharing some best practices, discussing metrics like appeal and engagement, and helping us understand how child development, education, and UX principles can be used to inform research. So if there's still some pizza left, feel free to stick around and eat some more and mingle. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in another two weeks. Thank you. <laughs>